Well, good, good afternoon, everyone. Let's get started here. Um, my name is Doug Stevenson. I am a developer advocate with the Firebase team. I have two jobs today. One is to tell you about my experience with bytecode manipulation, and the other is to keep you awake after lunch. So if I yell into a microphone here, that's me shaming someone for being asleep during this talk. So, um, so if you hear a yell, you should, you should perk up and be alert. Pretend you weren't sleeping, because I am shaming you. Uh, before I was at Google, I was at a startup called Pulse.io. And our big mission, all five of us, uh, was to make sure that Android and iOS developers could get a sense of how their application was performing in production by just dropping in our SDK and writing no code. So the idea was uh, we'd be able to tell you things like your application startup time and how your HTTP transactions are actually performing and look at like, you know, actual endpoints and see you know, what is the latency, what is the round trip time uh, from the client's point of view. And this is kind of important uh, because when you're testing your app on your fast local device against your fast local servers, you tend to not perceive problems, but the moment you ship it, Users around the world can have different performance characteristics, so you need to know what those are. Uh, now this product launched, it did okay, uh, it was eventually acquired by Google, and it is basically the foundation for what you know as Firebase Performance Monitoring. So uh, for those of you who use Firebase Performance Monitoring, I don't need to give you an overview. For, for those of you who don't, it does basically what Pulse.io did uh, with a little extra stuff. Now, uh, like I said, it's important to understand the performance of your application in the wild, because that's how your users are perceiving it. That's where your one-star ratings are coming from, from your users who are having bad performance. Um, so you need to understand how your application performs in the wild. Now, locally, it's pretty easy to get a sense of how your app is performing, because you use a tool called SysTrace. And SysTrace uh, hooks up your phone or your emulator to your computer over a fast ADB connection, and it collects a ton of information, almost too much information. It can be hard to dissect all of this. Uh, but it works because your phone is hooked up locally. There's a high bandwidth communication channel, which is great for collecting information. Uh, it's also bad for the performance of your application. So if you've ever used SysTrace, you know that everything crawls when SysTrace is on and collecting information. So this, is, this strategy won't work in production for two reasons. First of all, you don't have a high bandwidth debug connection to your user's devices. And the other is you can't slow down your app in production. That would just be terrible. So your app has to be collecting information, useful information, but also not have its performance impacted. Uh, so what happens with Firebase performance monitoring is you have your app. It's installed in clients all around the world. And they're all sending performance telemetry into Firebase's cloud, which is actually just Google's cloud. And then that information gets aggregated uh, on a periodic basis, and it populates the dashboard. So you can see where in the world your users are, are uh, using your app. You can see some like HTTP transactions. You can see just general diagnostic information, which is really helpful. Uh, in particular, you get HTTP transaction information um, throughout your app. So every component in your app, not just the code you write, but also your third-party SDKs, which can, can be very uh, informative to see what these SDKs are doing and how fast they're doing it. Um, you can see that this, this list is actually opinionated. So the, the three lines at the top, the little exclamation point, uh, is Firebase telling you, hey, we think these are the worst. You should look at these first if you're really concerned about the performance of your app. So not only is it sending you facts, it's also sending you some opinion about how you should optimize. Uh, and then if you drill into one of those URLs or URL patterns, you get to see some more um, heuristics information, uh, which is really good, really actionable stuff, super helpful for understanding how your app works. Uh, I'm not here to sell you on this. Like Firebase Performance Monitoring is free, like it's free to use. So I'm just giving you an overview of what it does to give you some context about what I'm going to talk about. Uh, but the big question is, if you want to build something like this, how do you build a no-code HTTP data collector? Remember, our goal is to give you an SDK that you just drop in. You don't actually have to interact with it. Uh, it just works, um, which is kind of, kind of an interesting problem to solve. Uh, now, remember, it's measuring HTTP transactions. And those can come from a variety of different libraries. So you have OK HTTP, uh, Java URL connection, Apache, uh, what is it, HTTP client. We had to support all of these. So at the time, we shipped this in 2014. So we, these are the three main ones in use, and we had to use all of them. Now, if you don't know, uh, if you've ever tried to do anything like this, you probably know that there are no hooks to just collect HTTP information. These libraries don't just give you a super easy way to say, OK, all of those HTTP transactions, just tell me what they're doing. And in fact, that would be kind of you know, maybe a security problem for, to let any component just sniff your transactions. So that's, you can't just use an API hook for that. So 
there are three ways that I came up with that are possibilities for doing HTTP transaction collections. One is you just modify the app's source code. Uh, so the idea is you would look for, throughout all the source, where are all the HTTP transactions happening and change it, uh, which is not a real good idea and I'll say why later. Uh, for those of you who know JVM programming, JVM has something called an agent. And an agent is something you give it on the command line and tell it, hey, you know, this code is going to run in, uh, jump in place, and intercept all of the class loads, and then maybe do something when, when each class is loaded. Uh, but it turns out Android doesn't actually run a JVM. It runs Dalvik or Art, which are like, uh, you know, they're, they're not a JVM. So this feature doesn't exist with Dalvik and Art, and it shouldn't because it's kind of a security hole. If any app could just register an agent for itself. That kind of wouldn't be a good idea. Uh, the third option here is to modify the bytecode of compiled JVM classes before you deploy your app. And it's important to do this before you deploy your app because your APK is basically immutable once you ship it. You can't make changes to it. You can't also, like I said, intercept the classes when they're loaded. There's no agent. So the first two are unviable. Um, you can't modify the app's source code, right? No developer would knowingly give you access to all of their source code and let you change it and then expect you to keep doing the right thing. Like that's just not an option. Like I said, there's no agent. So the third option is really the only viable option. The idea here is to look at all the classes that are in the entire app change them at build time before they go into the final APK. So my task is, uh, one specific task is to look for URL, Java URL connection. Now I said that the SDK supports three different libraries. I'm only going to talk about one just to keep it simple. This is a sample code that you might write to get the first 15 bytes of www.google.com. So you see it's uh, building a URL, uh, getting a byte array, calling open connection, all that getting an input stream, reading, and closing. So this is pretty typical URL connection code. Now, if you're trying to look for this code somewhere in the app, you don't have the source code available. What you have is bytecode. So you have to look for this pattern in bytecode, make changes to the bytecode, and write that back out before it hits the APK. Um, and it turns out, just as a side note, I had to do this in 2014 for both Gradle, because Gradle was uh, up and coming, like new support on Android. And we also had to do it for Ant. So for those of you who have done uh, Android for a very long time know that you had to do ant builds, which was by today's terms kind of primitive, but we had to support both. Um, so I had, I had to write some code to sort of get into the builds of either one of those. Now if you think about the Android build process at a very high level, you start with some Java or Kotlin code and that gets sent through a compiler which generates classes, gets bundled up into jars. Now once you have all of your classes in jars, that goes through something called uh, DX or D8, which changes those classes into uh, DEX and those DEX files. Uh, are created and they get loaded, or actually they get processed by AAPT2, which does things like uh, take your manifest, take all your DEX files, take all your resources and other stuff and bundle them all together into a final APK. So this is the general process I had to deal with. I had to get into this build process. Now the best way to do this, really the only viable way to do this, is to take the process that creates all the jars. So after all the jars and all the classes are compiled and generated, but before they go off to DX or D8, I have to insert my stuff here. This is where my code has to go. Uh, but this begs the question, where are these classes? Where do they live? How do you get a hold of them? Um, and how exactly do you hook into the build process to make this happen? Now, like I said, I had to support Gradle and Ant, and neither of those at the time actually had a proper way of hooking into the build. Uh, and they also didn't have a way of telling you where the compiled classes were. There was a convention for knowing the paths, but there was no API to tell you this is definitely where things live. Uh, so I had to do some really ugly stuff to make this happen. I had to get into the task, both Gradle and uh, Ant, get into the DX task, and look and see where it was internally storing lists of jars and classes. And notice these are private variables. These are not exposed. There's no API for this. So what I had to do is at build time, um, get into these private runtime uh, uh, configurations with reflections. So I'm reaching into the class, reaching into the private members that it doesn't want me to get a hold of, and just change them. Just say, OK, I know where you think all the jars are. I'm actually going to copy all those jars, make changes to them, stick them somewhere else, and then fool you into using those instead of the ones that you originally had. Now, you should never do this. This is a really bad idea. This is what scrappy startups do to get acquired by larger companies. I'm not proud of this engineering. Uh, the, <laughs> the, the, the good thing is you don't don't have to do this today. This is no longer necessary. We have, we have better tools for this now. Uh, with the Android Gradle build tools, now what you can do is 
register transforms with an Android build. So after classes and jars are built, any transforms that you have registered will process in order until uh, the last transform is actually ProGuard. So today, ProGuard is implemented as a transform. It's the last transform in the, in the stage of transforms. And then all that output gets sent to DXDA. So if you want to do bytecode manipulation on an Android build, you pretty much today have to use a transform for that. So my project uh, that I built, and there's sample code for this. So at the end, you'll get a URL to my GitHub that shows you everything that I'm talking about, sort of a stripped down version. It's not the actual plugin, it's sort of a stripped down minimal plugin. Uh, so there's three parts to this. One, there's a Gradle plugin, so it hooks into Gradle, hooks into the Android build, uh, does all the bytecode stuff. That's the most interesting part. Then there's a companion SDK, an actual Android module that supports the work of the uh, bytecode manipulation, but uh, does it at runtime. And then there's a sample app that actually gets transformed. Uh, the way it's organized is like this. There's an app at the top level. And then the two libraries, the module and the plugin, since they're tightly paired with each other, uh, I work with those together in IntelliJ. I don't need an Android uh, IDE for this. The app I do in Android Studio, but the plugins and the modules I do in, uh, in IDEA. So let's talk about the Transform Gradle plugin. Uh, this is a pretty standard build. It's just a uh, standard Kotlin build. Uh, we're using the standard repositories and the standard dependencies, but uh, you'll notice that the first dependency here is the Gradle API. You always need to do that if you're doing stuff in Gradle. The second dependency here might look kind of familiar to you. Does it look familiar? It should because every Android build has one of this. This is the Android build tools. This is, you normally put this in the class path of your Android build, but here it's a compile dependency. Uh, in fact, it's a compile only dependency because I'm assuming that this plugin has already been applied for the Android app build and I'm gonna call APIs in it at build time. So I have to declare it as a dependency so I can use its APIs during build. I'm also using Kotlin standard lib, of course, and uh, a couple of support libraries, Commons.io, which makes reading and writing files super easy, and ASM, which I'll talk about later. That's the tool that does the actual bytecode manipulation. Uh, in order to get this to work, in order, well, any Gradle plugin, you need to declare where your plugin entry point is. So there's a met, in the meta inf folder, in the Gradle plugins folder, there's a special line that you have to write that tells Gradle, hey, this is where my plugin starts. This is essentially main. Um, so the Gradle plugin looks like uh, this, it subclasses plugin, there's an apply method that you override, and that apply method gets called when the plugin is applied. And so we can do a bunch of stuff in there. Specifically, we're gonna look and see if that Android plugin has been added to the project. If it hasn't, we have nothing to do. This is not an Android build, so we should bail out and not do anything. Uh, but if it is an Android build, we're going to dig into it and register a transform with it. So this is us, this is me telling the Gradle, telling the Android build tools, I have a transform, I wanna register it. This is the class, and the class is called my transform. Uh, there's also a little extra code here that deals with extensions. So if you're familiar with Gradle, Gradle has this uh, concept of an extension which lets you add to the Gradle DSL. So if you want to let someone configure your Gradle plugin at build time, you can add a little bit of code that lets you do some Gradle stuff to pass it parameters and stuff. Okay, the transform class itself has to subclass transforms. You'll see there uh, we, have a, we have a subclass of transform, which is, again, that's a superclass provided by the Android build tools. And then we have to override a bunch of stuff. The first thing is we'll give it a name. The name is just the name of this class. Uh, but the more important thing is we have to tell it what types of things we're interested in transforming. Uh, the Android Gradle build tools, let, I think there's two things you can transform. I don't remember what the first one is. I think it's resources. The other one is classes. So I'm saying I'm interested in classes. That's what I want to transform. So whenever you get some classes, send them to me, let me know about them. Um, and then I have to return that value out of get input types. That's me telling the plugin, hey, I'm interested in classes. But which classes? Uh, well, it turns out I'm interested in all of the classes. So I have to tell it what scope I want to receive classes for. There are three scopes. Project, which is the project, those classes that are built in the project itself. The sub-projects, so any sort of, uh, any other Android modules that are added on. And external libraries means all third-party dependencies anywhere throughout your app. So if you set this as your scopes, you will know about every single class file that goes through the build and gets added to your app. This is how I'm able to trap all of those HTTP calls, whether they're in your app or in a third-party library. I also have to tell it if I support incremental builds. Um, if you ever write a plugin, please do support incremental builds. If you don't, you will make the app build very, very slow as it has to send you every single class file for every single build. So uh, I won't say too much about this other than it's really important to be able to support incremental builds. 
and the transform method is the thing that kicks off. So when it's time to do the transform, the Android Gradle build tools will call you here. The important thing to note is that you receive a transform invocation object. And this transform invocation object describes everything that's being passed to your build. Um, and there's, I, I won't go through all of this other code right now. Basically, um, I'm going to create a configuration of my own and I'm going to kick off my transform impl and just call uh, do it on there. This just says, Go, go do what you need to do in the transform. Uh, but the first thing you need to know about is the transform invocation interface. So this is a Java interface, not a Kotlin interface. It's provided by the Android build tools. It's telling you what are your inputs. So what's being fed to you? Uh, what are your reference inputs? What are your secondary inputs? These are each of the different inputs, classes, jars, that your app is going to handle. So you have to query each one of these to find them all out. Uh, there's also an output provider. The output provider basically tells you, now that you know all the classes that are coming into your app, where do you write them? You have to stick them somewhere. You don't overwrite them. You just copy them, minimally copy them into this output provider. Uh, and you have a series of output providers for each one of the inputs. And you also tell it whether or not this is an incremental build. Uh, so this is the code of the transform. Uh, can you read that okay? You might, maybe you can take a picture and zoom it up afterward. Um, actually, I don't recommend, the point is this, is, this is actually really boring code. I'm not gonna show any of it to you, but if you wanna see it, it's in the open source repo at the end. So if you're interested in all of the iterating of all the inputs and managing all the outputs and just lots and lots of really boring paperwork, Go study this code, it's really interesting. I'll boil it down to you in terms of pseudocode. So basically, we take each of the transform inputs. We, take, uh, we ask it for each of the jars and the directories. We iterate all the jars and directories. We figure out if the input requires processing. We get an output location for the input. And then uh, we iterate all the jars and directories. If it's a class file, read the bytecode and do the one interesting thing here, which is invoke ASM and do the bytecode manipulation. Otherwise, just copy the files around. So that's what that 200 lines of code boils down to right here is just a lot of iteration. Uh, but I'll go into the ASM stuff because that's really interesting. Uh, ASM is a bytecode processor. It is the grandparent of all other bytecode processors. If you, if you know of any other bytecode processors, they all use ASM behind the scenes because it's really low level, like bare bones. You will find out everything there is to know about um, Java class files if you use ASM. Now the way ASM works is it uses the, vid the visitor pattern to deliver class content. So uh, at the very top level, if you do anything with ASM at all, you will need to understand what a class visitor is. If you have a class visitor, uh, you pass it off to ASM and it says, okay, I'm going to find a class file and I'm gonna visit all of its components. I'm gonna visit all of its classes, inner classes, outer classes, annotations on those things, fields within the class, methods within the class, and so on and so on. So you're gonna get callbacks for each one of these. It's kind of like a SACS parser. If you've ever done SACS style parsing, it's event driven, um, except we don't call them events, this is, these are visitors. The important, another important thing to know here is that for some of these visitors, they return yet another visitor. So this is just saying, uh, if you want to visit an annotation and you want more information about it, you have to return another visitor that itself will get called with information about the uh, annotation. But the one thing that's really interesting for bytecode manipulation is the method visitor. The method visitor is going to get invoked for every method in a class file. So as it's going through the class file, it's gonna find static methods, uh, it's gonna find instance methods, and all of the information about those methods are gonna get delivered to your method visitor. So your method visitor is gonna be able to know things like the parameters that are being passed to it, any annotations on it, the code itself, the actual bytecode, um, and any local variables, any methods calls within that method, and uh, when the method is over. So you need to trap all of these to get a hold of all, everything that's in every class file that you want to process. So this is kind of an overview of how a ASM works. So let's actually visit some bytecode. I swear I will get to the bytecode. Uh, but first a little bit, before we get to the bytecode, let's go look at the JVM first. So if you're not familiar with how a JVM works at a very high level, I'll give you a quick overview. Um, there's a constant pool. So every class has a constant pool. There is exactly one per class. It contains things like pre-computed values, strings, numbers, references, types to other things, and it's indexed by position. So if you dump a, uh, a class file using Java P, you will see things like this. So um, index number five is a string called onCreate. Uh, index number six is a type, or is a, uh, is a string that describes the type of onCreate. Um, you can tell this is an Android activity class because we have onCreate and bundle and annotations and stuff like that. So just know that there's a constant pool and you reference everything by number. Uh, every method has local variables. So if you're familiar with how a CPU works, these are like registers. 
Um, they're indexed also by position. And zero, if it's an instance method, zero is always going to be this. So this is actually a local variable in terms of the JVM. And the local variables typically match one to one with Java and Kotlin local. So if you declare a new local variable, it will inevitably show up in the local variable table, which looks something like this. So what you see here is the local, uh, local table for a runnable. You can see index zero at the bottom. Slot zero is this. Uh, you can see that it declares a URL, a byte array, a connection, and an input object. The operand stack uh, is another important thing, and I'm going to manipulate this a lot later on. So the way the operand stack is, code will push values onto it, so constants, locals, fields within uh, that class. So you push values onto it, and then you execute operations against those operands. So uh, if you want to do math on a bunch of variables, you will push values onto, push the values you want to add onto the stack, and then call the add method. Or if you want to invoke a method, you push the parameters to it, then invoke the method. Uh, then when the operation is done, the values are popped off. I like to think of it like kind of like reverse Polish notation. So if you've ever used a calculator that does RPN, you know that you put all the numbers first, then the operator at the end. Uh, the operand stack works kind of like that. So if you wanted to add two values in Kotlin or Java, you would uh, push two values to, um, these are pushing the value one and two, uh, then it's going to call the add instruction, and then it's going to pop the A and B off the stack, then push the result of that back onto the stack for consumption later on. So this is just a really simple example. And then there's the stack frame. So for every method that ever gets invoked on a thread, a stack frame is created. It's going to contain all the local variables and the operand stack. The maximum size of this is known in advance. The compiler is telling you, I know the maximum number of local variables. I know how big the operand stack will ever get at any given moment. That's your stack frame. Um, that, so the whole thing is popped on for a method call, and the whole thing is popped off again when the method returns. OK, so that's a little bit of background. Let's get into some bytecode processing. Uh, so class instrumenter is a custom class. Um, you might remember that from a few, fr uh, few, a few slides ago. Um, it's going to take some configuration, and what it's going to do is have an instrument method. And that instrument method is really simple. It takes a byte array as input. That's the class file, the contents of the class file, and it returns a byte array. That's the modified contents of, of the class file. So what I'm going to do is say, hey, ASM, your class reader, start reading those bytes. So a class reader is an ASM object. Um, I'm going to use that and also create a class writer. So the class writer is the opposite of the class reader. It's basically saying, I know how to generate class files. Um, here's a class writer, and it needs to know. There's one little interesting piece of information in there. It needs a class loader that describes all the classes that could be referenced by the class that's being processed. Uh, so that comes from the configuration. So if you look all the way at the top, the private val CL, uh, from the configuration, I'm basically saying, Based on what I know about this Android build, I'm going to build a class path with all the classes that could ever go into this. Um, and if you're interested in how that works, go dig into the source code a little bit more. Uh, but the point is, I have a class reader. I have a class writer. Now my custom class instrumentation visitor is going to decorate the class writer. So instead of writing directly to a class writer, I'm going to write to my instrumentation visitor. The instrumentation visitor is going to visit all the methods, visit all the instructions, and then write out to the class writer what it wants. So um, when, when we call CR accept, that basically says, hey, class reader, go start parsing things and notify the instrumentation visitor of everything that you find. Uh, and then when that's all done, the class writer will just return all the bytes that were generated from the class writer. OK, pretty simple, right? Oops, I forgot to walk through this line by line. Wow, I had all this great animation. <laughs> all right, so here's what happened here. Um, at a very high level, we have input class bytes. We're going to send them through the class reader. The class reader is going to invoke the visitor methods of my class, which is a class visitor. And then it's going to decorate a class writer. Uh, it's going to invoke, turn around and invoke methods of the class writer, and that's going to generate the modified class file. So this is going to happen once for every class in the entire build, which it sounds kind of expensive, and it is, and I might talk a little bit about that later. So here's what instrumentation visitor looks like. It's a decorator pattern. So it takes as input a class visitor, and it, in itself, subclasses class visitor. It's decorating the given class visitor, which is the class writer from the prior frame. Uh, there are a couple methods in there to override. So now we're overriding ASM APIs. At a top level, you can visit. Visit will get called whenever the uh, a class file uh, has some basic things known about it. So the version, the access flags, class name signature, and so on. Um, as it 
visits each one of the methods in the class. We're going to get a method for visit method. And this is going to describe uh, the name of the method, the, descri the description, the signature of the method, any exceptions that it throws. And this, this override actually is going to tell, is, is getting closer to where the bytecode will appear as we're processing it. So all we have to do is override it. Uh, what we're going to do is call through to the decorated uh, visitor. So we're going to say, hey, give me the visitor for this method. And what I'm going to do is, again, decorate it with my method visitor and return it. So now when a method is visited, instead of the superclasses class visitor, I'm going to use my own. And then that's going to do the bytecode processing. Then inside my method visitor, uh, method visitor subclass is advice adapter. Now, advice adapter is a special ASM class that, like, that makes it easy to read and write bytecode within the visitor. So it's going to have special methods that you can use to understand instructions that, that are being parsed and also generate new instructions on the way out. Uh, one very special method in here is visit method instruction. Visit method instruction will get invoked for every single bytecode instruction in every single method. This is our chance. This is the good chance to read the bytecode, make changes to it, and write to it. But before I show you that, I have to remind you what we're trying to do again since we've started to go pretty far down the rabbit hole. What we're trying to do here is look for HTTP transactions that look like this. So the call to URL open connection is very important to me because that signals when an HTTP transaction is about to begin. So we need to look for code that looks like this, then make changes to it. So if we were to put this method into a Java class file and then dump it out with Java P, and again, Java P is a program that comes with the JDK. It basically will disassemble, decompile, and show you every, well, not decompile, but disassemble everything that's in the class file, dump it out so you can see what's in that class file. It's very instructional. It's also very difficult to read, so I'll try to unpack some of what's going on here. So if I dump this class and I look for the make request method, uh, you can see it's telling me something about the make request method. There's that local variable table that you saw before. Um, so what it's doing is it's showing me all the local variables. Um, by the way, in the upper right-hand corner is the Kotlin code. That's always going to be there, so you can compare the Kotlin with the bytecode that comes from the class. So we have the local variable table, and now we have some actual bytecode. Now we're getting into the instructions of this method, and I'm showing the Kotlin with the instructions that are generated from it, so line by line. So we can see here we're creating a new URL object. Uh, so we're going to use the new instruction. We're going to pass it the string that uh, we're going to push the string that we want to access into it. And we're going to call the special constructor for that, store that back in local variable one, uh, create a new byte array. Um, I'm not going to go through line by line, but you can kind of see how the, the line of Kotlin matches up with the bytecode that's generated for it. Um, now here's where things get interesting. The line of Kotlin that says, I want to open connection on that URL. So what we're doing is we're loading that URL into a local variable, and we're going to invoke virtual, which means invoke the instance method called uh, open connection on it. So that, that pound 20 refers to URL.open connection. That's the, that's, the local that's the local constant, the constant variable, the constant value uh, that describes that open connection call. Um, then there's a bit of hidden Kotlin. So I was um, somewhat surprised to see that Kotlin is itself doing its own bytecode manipulation. It's actually injecting this, this bit of code here to check if values are null. That's how Kotlin sort of ensures some of its type safety go or its uh, nullability going on in there. Um, then we're going to um, load the connection that's generated from that, call, get input stream on it. So that's another invoke virtual on line 27. And then there's some more hidden Kotlin uh, that does the null check on that. Now, for, for the purpose of understanding what this code does, we can remove the, the Kotlin extra stuff. That's added by Kotlin for nullability checks at runtime. Uh, we don't need to use that to understand, so I'll just compress all that down for the purpose of understanding this. Now, again, the really important thing here for me as someone who's trying to look for an HTTP transaction is that line 16, invoke virtual pound 20. That's the key that an HTTP transaction is about to start. So what I want to do is find that, figure out what it's doing, and make it do something different. Um, so at a high level, what I want to do is take this line of code, this open connection, and I want to transfer it, or I want to um, convert it into a method call of my choosing. So this URL connection instrumentation, that's a utility class that's going to be in my support library. Um, I'm going to 
make a method on it called open connection and pass it the URL. So this, there's the before and after. I need to do bytecode manipulation to perform this. Um, then open connection at runtime will take the URL and return a decorated URL connection. So we're going to go ahead and call open connection on it anyway, um, but we're going to return to the caller a different URL connection than the one they were expecting. But it's still a URL connection, and it still behaves exactly like the original one. Um, in a more general sense, now let's, we'll talk about this mathematically. What I want to do is take an object with a method call that takes some parameters and returns a result and wrap that in a utility call. That's all we're doing. Uh, what we're going to do is um, illustrate that instead of calling a method on an object, we're going to pass the object to a utility method. All the parameters are going to get passed as subsequent parameters. Um, then what we're going to do is call through to the original method. So we still want this method, to, we want this wrapped function to do the same thing. Uh, but it's going to return an object. And instead of returning it directly, we're going to decorate it in this decorator object. So that's, at a very high level, the general pattern for what we're trying to implement. It's not just Java URL connection. It's not just OKHTTP. It's all of them. They all follow this pattern. Uh, so the bytecode change depends on doing one weird trick. There is just one weird trick. Uh, every, you know, if you were expecting some like crazy amount of bytecode to, to come out, of this is not. It's just one weird trick. Uh, what we're, what we're going to do is take that invoke virtual, the one that signals that the method call that's very interesting to me is about to get executed. Um, with, what the JVM is going to do is, well, not the JVM, Dalvik, is going to pop four items off the stack, OBJ, A, B, and C. So that blue box on the left describes the stack before this instruction is about to get executed. Then it's going to make a new frame with OBG, A, B, and C as locals, call the function on the object, and push the returned object on the stack. So the blue box on the right is the state of the stack after the call. What I want to do is turn this into an invoke static. Instead of a virtu invoke virtual, which is a method call, I want to invoke static. And I want it to be my utility class instead. Uh, so this code is going to do almost exactly the same thing. Just like the other one, it's going to pop four items off the stack and make a new stack frame with those four items. Um, it's also going to push the returned result object back onto the stack. The point where it's different is all we're going to do is call a static method instead of the virtual method. That is the one weird trick. We're taking this invoke virtual and turning it into an invoke static. We're essentially redirecting the call into that method of interest and sending it to um, support code instead. So that's what the companion library does. The companion library provides the implementation of the invoke static. So after the one weird trick is applied, all we've done is erase that line 16 invoke virtual and replace it with an invoke static. That's it. That's all we have to do. Um, now, how do you do it? Well, let's revisit that visitor. So if you recall before, we have my method visitor. And inside that, there's an override for visit method instruction. This visit method instruction is going to get invoked for each one of those invoke virtuals. So all we have to do inside that method is check to see what that method call is. So I'm checking that it's a method on URL, that it's called open connection, and that it takes a URL connection parameter as an argument. So if you see that, that parentheses L Java net URL connection, that's just JVM speak for an ar a, a function that takes no arguments but returns a URL connection. That's the signature. So once we validated that this instruction is exactly what we want, what we can do then is um, redirect that into, an invo or into a method invocation that is in static, not virtual. But if it's not a method we're interested in, in the else clause, we just have to pass that right through. We don't want to make any changes to it. We're just going to let the, the original method visitor do whatever it was going to do. So this is, this is all we're doing. We're just replacing, swapping that call at, uh, at build time. Now, if you're wondering what URL connection instrumentation does, that utility function, this is essentially what it does. It's going to take that URL as an argument, call, go ahead and call open connection on it, check to see what kind of URL connection it is. So it can be an HTTPS URL connection or a regular HTTP URL connection. There are different classes, different methods, we have to have a different um, decorator for each one of them. If it's not one of those, it could be a file URL connection. We're not interested in it. Just return it as is. OK, and the decorator itself looks something like this. So you'll know that instrumented HTTPS URL connection subclasses HTTPS URL connection. So it is an HTTPS URL connection. And what we're obliged to do here is override all of its methods, every single one of them. We can't drop one of the calls. 
The client app is going to try to call each one of these methods. That's, well, not each one of them, but any one of them. And we have to make that URL connection do what it was originally supposed to do. But we have to add some instrumentation to it. So you'll notice here on get input stream, I'm actually saying, OK, get input stream signals the beginning of a transfer of data. So now I have to return my own instrument and my own wrapped in, uh, input stream that looks to see how the input stream is being consumed, make measurements, and then send that off to Firebase. So that's, that's basically all the work that's being done. A lot of it is being done by a support library, but the bytecode manipulation is just doing that one weird trick of redirecting this, the method call into a static call. So in the end, what we've done here is this. We've used ASM to replace interesting method calls with static method calls. So we took an invoke virtual, turned it into invoke static. That invoke static is implemented by a support library um, that decorates the result. Um, and the decorators override all methods and always call through to the original objects. That's the recipe. Once you have this recipe down, now it's just a matter of pattern matching. All you're doing is looking for interesting methods and redirecting them to actual implementations. So inside the Firebase Performance Monitoring Library, you'll see that there's, well, th it's not open source yet. It will be open source someday. But what you'll see is it's massive amounts of configuration. It's looking for all the combinations of all the different API calls that are interesting to it. It's implementing all the decorators for all the methods that could be called by the, uh, by the host app and making measurements on them. And that's what it's doing. And it's internally measuring HTTP transactions. Now, the source that I'm going to show you at the end doesn't have any of that measurement, really. It just shows you how to do the bytecode manipulation and how to do the decorators. Uh, but you can imagine that it, after it's done with the transaction, it can uh, take that data, send it off to Firebase, and that populates your console. So if you do want to write your own transform, there's some things to keep in mind. As I mentioned before, transforms can be slow for very large apps. They are processing every single class file in the entire app before ProGuard strips anything out. So they have to be fast. Uh, you should implement, as I said, uh, incremental builds. If you don't do that, you're going to really cause the, uh, the host app some compile time problems. Um, you should allow the developer to disable it easily. And this was one of the big pieces of feedback about the Firebase Performance Monitoring plugin is that uh, it was not really possible except with very special Gradle code to disable it for debug builds but enable it for re uh, release builds. That's what most developers want. They don't need all this instrumentation at debug time, but they need it all at release time. Um, in fact, the latest version of the Firebase Performance Monitoring plugin has a special optimization using special implementation from the Android Gradle plugin that actually looks at the build type. It will let you know, is this a debug build? Is this a release build? You can choose before you apply the transform if you want to apply the transform. So if you're using performance monitoring and you're not using the latest version, go get the latest version. It's better. Um, and don't process classes unnecessarily. So if you can knowingly skip a class without processing it, you should do that. Just copy it into the destination folder instead of sending it through a transform. You should not transform your companion library classes. Now, this is, this is a strange piece of device. I got bit by this um, in my own project. If you transform your own libraries, you are rewriting your own code that rewrites that, that redirects your code. So if you instrument every call to open connection, your own call to open connection will get rewritten and you'll end up with, a, with, with a, a stack overflow error. You will have your static method calling your static method, calling your static method. That's a really bad idea. So skip your companion library classes. Um, write integration tests. So when I, at, at Pulse.io, when I originally wrote this, I was paranoid about writing, rewriting other people's code. Think about this. You're writing code that rewrites an entire other app's code. This is really risky, right? If, if you get this wrong, you, you're, you will lose customers, right? So we can't really afford to do that. So I wrote a ton of code that just loaded classes, loaded modified classes, compared that they were doing exactly the same thing. Make sure every I is dotted and T is crossed before shipping this product. Um, another hint is that Gradle T install is my friend. So what this will let you do is run Gradle as a foreground process that's constantly looking for changes to source code and recompiling them. This is helpful for me uh, to speed up my development so I don't have to, if I make change to a plugin, to compile it, install it, and then compile my app against it. So I, I have this running all the time whenever I develop. That's all I have right now. If you want to see the code, go to this URL. Um, the URL will have a, a whole project that you can download and run for yourself, and you can see the bytecode manipulation work. Um, I think it's kind of fun if you're interested in it. Um, and I don't know, do I have time for questions? A few minutes? I have a couple minutes. So who, do, do, do you have any questions? I just dumped a bunch of information on you. I'm sure there's a question out there. Oh, over here. <laughs> 
I don't know what the tools inside Android, Android Studio do. I suspect that they're not doing bytecode manipulation simply because they have access to very low level information about what Android is doing. Um, as an SDK edition, I don't have access to any of that, so I have to rewrite the bytecode. Um, but yeah, you probably ask one of the, there's two Android people in here, they know the answer. <laughs> Anyone else? Up with Gradle Ooh, or is that a, a general accepted term? Oh, Gradle. Oh, that's just that's just how it looks to me. Okay. I don't know. It's just Gradle wrapper. I don't want to say Gradle wrapper. I just want to say Gradle Ooh. <laughs> okay. Did I just coin a new term? I don't know. What do you say? <laughs> Gradle. Okay. Well, <laughs> there was a question over here. Yeah. Yeah, I love this. I Yeah, so the question is, what are some other use cases? You know what, I've talked with other people about this, especially at DroidCon, or not DroidCon, uh, Android Makers France, and I can't remember what they were doing, but they were like, this totally solves all my problems. I can't, for the life of me, remember what that problem was, unfortunately. Uh, but there are use cases out there. I think particularly anything that you need to do where you can't, uh, so I don't know, have you heard of um, uh, aspect-oriented programming? Have you heard that term? This is basically aspect-oriented programming. I'm looking for patterns within code, making changes. So if you want to do any sort of aspect-oriented programming, but you don't want to use aspect J, which is like the standard tool for that, um, you, could, you can implement it this way. So it's a lot of work. The aspect J might be easier. But if you're using Kotlin, you kind of don't have as aspect J at your disposal. So I saw another hand. Yeah. Um, so uh, you talked a couple times about um, making sure uh, you talked a times about making sure that So, uh, um, could you restate your question? So, uh, I'm not quite sure exactly. So you're talking about making sure that the transform works incrementally. Yeah, yeah. And I think all I saw code-wise was like setting, setting a value true versus false. Is there more to the implementation than that? Uh, like the um, part, part of, so incremental builds basically just, it, it's a matter of telling the, uh, recognizing as input if something actually changed and then choosing not to do anything with it. It's also making sure that when you output something that you're saying if it changed or not. It's basically saying, it's basically being a good citizen and understanding what inputs change and what outputs change and doing the minimal amount of work. Um, that's my best understanding. I, I, it's been a while since I've been through that, I'll remember all that page of code, that 200 lines of code. I actually don't remember a lot of what that does because I wrote that like months ago. But it's all in there, I swear. <laughs> Yeah. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. <laughs>